Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Good morning, YouTube. Welcome back to The Realignment's daily coverage of the Ukraine crisis with Russia's invasion of the country. We are actually on the one month anniversary of the invasion. It's really important we take a moment to realize how incredible it is that the Ukrainians have managed to last this long. It's really a testament not only to their skill on the battlefield, but also, frankly, to the real gross incompetence and corruption that has really plagued the Russians going this far into the conflict. We aren't gonna be doing these daily episodes that's that much longer. So I want to as much as possible hit the topics that we really need to hit because ideally this conflict will be solved or at least settled to a degree which is acceptable. Today's episode features Scale AI's head of federal, Mark Valentine. He is a former F-16 fighter pilot who now works in the area of AI and is really interested in the intersection of AI, machine tooling, and the ability to see what is happening on the battlefield, especially when it comes to satellites. So this aspect of the conversation in terms of our daily coverage is focused on the topic of artificial intelligence and what it means on the battlefield in Ukraine and moving forward. Hope you enjoy this episode. Mark Valentine, welcome to The Realignment. Hey, thanks, Marshall. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to hit a bunch of different topics, everything from AI to your background in the Air Force. You're at Scale AI now. You were at Microsoft before. But let's just start with the very obvious. We just did an episode on air power in Ukraine, the specific style of combat we're seeing there. You were in the Air Force, you you flew jets. So I'd just love for you to just introduce your background in the military and just honestly, as long as you wanna go on your background in the military and the world that you really grew up in specifically, how that relates to what you're seeing now in Ukraine. Yeah, actually happy to do that, Marshall. So uh, hello everyone, I'm Mark Valentine uh, from Scale AI. So as Marshall indicated, uh, I started my career in the U.S. Air Force. So as a young kid in Alabama, I went to the Air Force Academy, uh, was always a STEM type person. So I studied astronautical engineering uh, while I was uh, in my undergraduate studies at the Academy and always wanted to, to fly, whether that was in a, a, an airplane or maybe in space. Uh, that was the ultimate goal. Fell in love with the idea of tactical flying while I was at the Academy and pursued that for my Air Force career. So I flew F-16s for the majority of my career in the F-16 with a few of the standard uh, uh, timeouts at the Pentagon, uh, command and staff tours, et cetera. Uh, but most of my time was spent in the F-16. Because of my background uh, in, in engineering, I studied computer science as well. I kind of gravitated to the what I will call the nerdier aspects of flying fighters. So I was deep into electronic warfare, uh, advanced sensors, whether they were electro-optical, uh, EW, uh, what, what have you. So that's kind of where my, my interest lied. And so I kind of gravitated to, to roles within the, uh, the squatters that I was in that, that allowed me to, to do those things. So I also was a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Weapons School, uh, which allowed me to be a, uh, an instructor pilot, a uh, high-level instructor pilot in several squadrons and participated in uh, many different combat operations from uh, the initial uh, no-fly zone type things in Iraq uh, that started out called Provide Comfort, moved to Northern Watch, Southern Watch, et cetera. I participated in the initial invasion uh, of Iraq in 2003 and went back there again in 2006 uh, in, in different roles as fighter pilot, both on the air-to-air -air side and on the air-to-ground side. Uh, and then, like I said, spent some time in the Pentagon doing some policy work as well as some of the advanced schools that the Air Force uh, would send many of us to. So that was my, my military background. And when I look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, uh, it, it's tragic. Uh, and I wish that it wasn't going on, uh, but it's also interesting to me to see people prescribe policies around, hey, we should just do a no-fly zone, which indicate to me kind of a lack of understanding of what these concepts really mean. Uh, because to create a no-fly zone, implies that you are protecting someone from something else. And if that something else decides to take action, well, you have essentially implied that we will take action against them. And therefore, I think the escalatory aspects of uh, conducting a no-fly zone are something that the policymakers should really, really consider uh, before you know what seems like a really easy chess piece to move, oh, we'll make a no-fly zone, uh, is a lot harder in practice 
uh, than, than it is in theory, especially with the escalatory nature of it. Not to mention that there is a significant cost, not just in dollars, uh, but in readiness, because for every hour you have a group of human fighter pilots uh, essentially just turning <laughs> uh, circles in the sky waiting for something to happen is an hour that they are not preparing to do the higher end aspects of what that job is and what that job entails. Yeah, and we'll get to the AI aspect of this conversation, but one last follow-up here is what was it like to fly in the no-fly zone in Iraq? This would have been in the 1990s, correct? Yeah, so I think my first story over there was late 94, early 95. Uh, it, I, I remember the first time I did it, it was really eerie because, you know, as a, a U.S. fighter pilot training in U.S. airspace, it, going to and from the base to the training airspace, there are thousands of other airplanes and you hear them all on the radio and there's a little bit of uh, chaos going on. Whereas, you know, we got airborne, we were flying out of Turkey uh, into Northern Iraq when I first did this and you get that airspace and there's nothing, it is dead quiet. Uh, and so our specific role at the time was uh, to use a special sensor that we have in the airplane to make sure enemy surface radars were not emitting. Uh, and if they did, there were certain instances where we could shoot back at those radars. Uh, and that was to, uh, essentially to keep uh, Iraqi airplanes out of the sky so that they couldn't uh, uh, inflict any damage on the Kurds. So I, I would say that it was eerie the first few times that I did it, again, most of it, because of how quiet it actually was. Um, I mean, there were a few moments of terror that happened when uh, it seemed like certain things were, were happening or we had intel that certain things were happening. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say eerie was my, my number one uh, gut reaction of the first few times that I did it. Uh, as, as it continued, and when I was in, in Germany, we were deployed to, to Turkey for the Northern No-Fly Zone uh, roughly 230 to 250 days per year. Uh, so my wife jokes with me that I didn't live in Germany. She did, and I just visited. Uh, but, you know, that, that's why I talk about the readiness aspects, because that was 230 days over the course of that year where we didn't focus on the higher end uh, spectrum of the training we were trying to do. So those skills, they, they degrade over time. Uh, and so, you know, the skills that you use, uh, you know, maintaining a combat air patrol, waiting on a certain event to happen are different than you would use, say, in close air support to, to support U.S. or friendly ground forces that are on the ground uh, by dropping a weapon. So just as a quick example. So I could definitely tell that those skills started to degrade uh, while, you know, my specific air to air skills, because, again, we were more turning, turning orbits in the sky <laughs> than necessarily doing air to air uh, combat. Uh, those started to degrade as well. So I think there's a limited time frame you can have a single group of humans do that without experiencing that degradation. So the aspect of the current and future conflicts that we're covering today is just the idea of AI and how it can change the battlefield, but also change, once again, the broader space that we're discussing that's implicit within everything from your time in the 90s to today. So just introduce Scale AI and what your role there specifically is. Absolutely. So Scale AI is a late stage Silicon Valley startup. Uh, we are approximately five, maybe six years old now. Uh, and the company is a product of uh, our CEO. So our founder and CEO is a gentleman named Alex Wang. Uh, he's relatively young. I think he's 25 years old. And he was a freshman at MIT studying data science uh, when he had an epiphany. And his epiphany came because he thought his roommates or someone was stealing food out of his refrigerator. So he said, hey, I'm studying data science and machine learning. I will do something very simple. I will take a camera and I will identify who is stealing food from my refrigerator. Well, as it turns out, that problem is a lot harder to solve than he thought. And the reason it was so hard to solve is because in order to create an algorithm that could identify a specific face and say, here's who's stealing your food, it required a lot of data capture and then more importantly, data annotation uh, in order to create that model to begin with. And so uh, Alex's experience there taught him that, hey, if I had to do this to solve this problem and everyone is trying to solve this computer vision problem, my thesis is everyone is going to have this data annotation, data gathering, data annotation challenge. So I'm gonna create a company that can help solve that problem. And that's how Scale AI was born. So the company uh, started uh, primarily in the autonomous driving space. 
uh, because as people were starting to create computer vision algorithms and, and other uh, models uh, to help guide a, a a uh, self-driving car, should the car stop, should it go, should it turn left, should it turn right, uh, that took a very detailed understanding uh, and perception of the world around it. Uh, so I think uh, a combination of computer vision algorithms and, and, and other machine learning models. So these companies that were trying to attack the problem uh, found the same challenge Alex found. And that was, wow, we, we now have a lot of data, but these data are not very good at training the model. Why is that? Well, because you have to start with the baseline understanding, and that uh, is, is where the data annotation piece came in. So the company started annotating data primarily for the use of autonomous driving uh, vehicles uh, and did very well in that space and then kind of moved up the stack. Uh, and many of the tools that our machine learning engineers at scale use to solve that first challenge, we found that those were actually valuable as well and that other machine learning teams could use those. Uh, so you know, from that point, we started developing our models, whether it was in computer vision and natural language processing or understanding human speech and or writing. Uh, and now combining those things, being able to solve uh, difficult challenges that humans face. And I think at a, at a very high level, the, the reason we exist is to help humans and machines team together so that humans can do what humans do best, uh, which is use higher level reasoning and understanding and understand things like context and let machines do what machines do best, which is do math really fast, and then by doing so, emulate certain aspects of, of human perception, vision, language, et cetera. So the question is, specifically then given your background, you were at Microsoft before focusing on national security, you're in the Air Force, we talked about that. What specifically is your relevance to what Scale is doing? Obviously you're working on the federal side, but in terms yeah. of your background, what's the intersection there? Yeah, so I, I think uh, governments and militaries have the same problems that, that commercial industries have. Uh, and that is, we have a lot of data, whether those data are in the form of pictures, electronic warfare signals, or in the commercial instance, these could be bills of lading, uh, whatever, we have a large corpus of data. Much of it is doesn't necessarily connect to the other pieces. And we are at a point where can humans ingest all of those data and make sense of all of those data? And you know, if you look at a chart of the amount of data being slung around the world today, I mean, it is in the exobytes, which is just a massively... Uh, almost not understandable number because of the size of it. And we're at the point now where humans just cannot make sense of all of it. So much like in the commercial sector, and I'm sure you you have a smartphone and you probably use that to take pictures. And then curiously, you go to your uh, photo library. And if you just want to see pictures of a certain friend, you can type in their name and all of a sudden just their pictures show up. Well, that's an example of a computer vision model uh, that is being used that has identified your friend in this case and allows you to rapidly access pictures of them for, for your enjoyment, right? This, this is what you wanted to do. You want to see pictures of them. A machine helped you do that very rapidly. So that's a commercial use case. Uh, you could uh, ramp that up to a commercial industry. Uh, say you're a logistics company and you've got millions of bills of lading coming at you and you need to be able to make sense of those. You've got a couple of options. You can hire a large group of humans who can type all of those bills of lading into some machine readable format so that now you can use those data to uh, do supply chain management, to, to make sure that the trucks get where they need to be on time, et cetera. Uh, or you could employ a natural language processing model that could help that human understand that uh, and do a good 80% of the work and just highlight the confusion areas to the human so that they could resolve them. So those are two use cases. And I bring those up because when you move over to the government side of the ledger, the problems really aren't much different. Uh, you've got a limited number of human beings that have a, an amazing, massive amount of data coming their way and they need to make sense of it. So you know what, what we see right now, to use the, the Ukraine example, are there are hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of images uh, coming into military planners, both in the U.S., the Ukraine, uh, all the allied nations. Uh, but what do all those pictures mean? What, what are the humans actually looking for in those pictures? What are the insights they are trying to gain? And how the, can those insights be derived much faster? Uh, and so, again, you can 
get a bunch of human beings to watch all these videos and pictures and images and, and tell the commanders or the leaders what is important, or where possible, you can employ a machine learning model, whether it's a computer vision model, natural language processing, et cetera, in order to highlight these are the important things. So humans, you focus on these and we can disaggregate or essentially abstract away uh, the, the actual perception work so the human can focus on the, the understanding and the reasoning. So here's the question. That's essentially your thesis about the space. How much of that are we seeing on battlefields today? And how much of that is, we see this working in the foreseeable future? Yeah. So I think that, Marshall, is the, the critical question. And I think what we are witnessing right now, which is a pretty exciting time to be alive, actually, uh, is we are at an inflection point in, in history where the use of commercial uh, remote sensing data or commercial satellites providing data for national security purposes uh, is we're, we're at that inflection point. And I think it's, you have to take a step back and almost do a little history lesson. But I think the first commercial satellite ever launched was uh, Telstar, and that was like 1962 timeframe. So 60 years ago, the first commercial satellite was launched, uh, and it relayed television signals across the ocean. Uh, that was followed by a handful of others, but not many. So at a certain point in time, the 70s and the 80s primarily, and even the 90s, uh, we witnessed a situation where the vast majority of sensors or satellites on orbit were owned by governments uh, and operated by governments or governments. So in other words, think that the government owned the piece of equipment on orbit, they own the downlink of the data, they own the data itself, and then they uh, also own the derived insights from that data. Uh, somewhere in the 90s, we started to see an increase in the number of commercially owned satellites uh, of different modalities. So you know, electro-optical or just normal imaging things, synthetic aperture radar, we started to see an increase in that. And then in the late 20 or the late 2000s, 20, 2008, 2010 timeframe, you see a real explosion in the number of commercial uh, launches, which means an explosion in the number of commercial satellites. And a lot of that was due to investments that private companies were starting to make in commercial launch capability, which made launches so much cheaper. So the cost per pound to get to orbit drop drastically so you could put way more things in orbit. Well, guess what? As we prove with things like GPS, uh, as well as some of the uh, initial commercial imagery satellites like SPOT, these things had value. Uh, and we end up with a scenario today where there are almost six times as many commercial satellites on orbit that are doing imaging than there are government satellites. So each of those commercial companies now owns that device, it owns the downlink, it owns the data, uh, and the resulting insights. So, you know, when I talked about the explosion of data, uh, I mean, I think there are roughly uh, 4,500 satellites on orbit right now, about 2,900 of them owned by the U.S. government, uh, and, or, or sorry, that are U.S. Uh, based. Uh, and of that 2,900, I think 2,500 of them are commercial satellites. And then you got roughly 400 or so that are actually owned by the government. So you've now got a whole vast swath of data that you know, the US government doesn't own from tip to tail like it did its own sensors. Now let's make an assumption here that the government sensors are probably of higher quality because a whole lot more money was invested in them uh, in order to make them higher resolution. They could you know, get sharper images and things like that. So if we make that assumption, uh, I think there's still value in the vast number of commercial uh, satellites that, that are orbiting the Earth. So I, I think the value that you see is related to the higher numbers, because the higher numbers give a higher revisit rate. And what that means is the frequency at which any particular satellite or constellation of satellites can image a particular location on the ground. So if you've got a small number of high quality sensors, and it takes that sensor and I'm making numbers up now, 10 hours to get a picture, you might be better off with a lower resolution image in one hour. So the revisit rate matters. Uh, that higher revisit rate can also drive a higher responsiveness. So just like I said, would you rather wait 10 hours for the great image or one hour for the, hey, this is a good enough image? 
So responsiveness is also being increased by the, uh, the vast number of commercial satellites you have. And then the final thing, and, and I'll hear many people talk about this aspect, but I, I think the, vat, the higher number of uh, on-orbit vehicles increases resilience. And what I mean by that is the marginal capability decrease that you would experience by losing a single satellite is drastically reduced when you have a thousand of these things instead of two. Because if you have two and one of them is taken offline for whatever reason, uh, you've lost 50% of your capability. You take out one satellite out of a thousand satellite constellation, you've lost one one thousand of your capability. So I think in some ways the quantity uh, of vehicles on orbit uh, generates a quality all of its own. So now you've got vast uh, increase in the quantity uh, of uh, satellites, which are all generating data. You can see that you've got a huge proliferation of data. Uh, so there are many, many more pixels uh, that somebody needs to, to look at, but does having more pixels actually increase our end goal, which is making better decisions? And I don't necessarily think so. So it could be a yes or no question. So yeah, more pixels, but do I hire more people to analyze all those pixels? Or can I employ some sort of human machine teaming so that I can have the computer do what it does well uh, and identify important things that I now surface to a human? And so uh, again, I think we, have, we are beyond the point of diminishing returns uh, as far as the, the number of pixels and adding humans to it. Uh, and I think the only way to solve that problem is going to be to incorporate uh, machine learning models or, or AI to help identify the important things. Yes. Yeah, so many things I want to pick up around there. So let's just start on the third point when you're talking about resilience of satellites, you referred to losing, um, losing a satellite that could either be very direct or that could be almost a euphemism. An interesting aspect of the Ukraine conflict and just any conflict in general are the norms around what's okay and what isn't okay. So norm, Russia obviously doesn't like that NATO is supplying weapons to the Ukrainians, but it's a largely accepted norm that so long as the weapons supply don't reach a certain level, aka the MiG-29s were very controversial, but um, Javelins weren't controversial. This right. is going all the way back to the Korean War. It is acceptable that sides will do this. When it comes to satellites, again, and I, I wanna just make this point clear to the audience, what you are describing, and this isn't to your point, this isn't just theoretical, this is actually a, a scenario which we could see evolving. Do we have any understanding of what norms are developing around taking out, damaging, limiting the ability to intersect with satellites? Do, we have, do you have any thoughts on that, Bradley? Well, Marshall, I, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but you know, treaties exist, which essentially state that uh, you know, we will not militarize space. Uh, part of not militarizing means that uh, governments will not attack things that are in space. Uh, I've seen treaties violated before, so I, I'm not here to talk for the State Department or other governments. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I think the norms are probably more uh, binding than the, the treaties are at this point. Uh, I think what we can hope, and I emphasize hope, is that if someone were to uh, perform an offensive use in space to take out somebody else's satellite, break the you know, treaty commitments if they're a signatory or just break the norm of doing so, uh, my hope would be that the international opprobrium would rise to the point where that actor would be essentially, uh, they would be shamed into never doing it again. And I know that hope is not a strategy, uh, but I think that's where we are at this point, unless you know, government had the ability to essentially uh, retaliate uh, against such a such a use, uh, which is an interesting thing because you know, as more and more commercial satellites are on orbit around the Earth, it raises the question of whose responsibility is it to protect those satellites, and that's a really really interesting question uh, because I think each of the owners obviously bears some responsibility uh, to protect against things that they can understand, but, you know, is it reasonable to protect against uh, an attack from an enemy country? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, if an enemy to, were to attack a commercial business uh, in the continental United States, obviously the United States government would, would fight back. So at what point 
does that satellite, you know, it, it's under a U.S. flag. Uh, I imagine that the, uh, the laws of the sea are probably going to be uh, our best guide to how these things would be executed and adjudicated in the international community. And the key thing, that's why you introduced this concept by talking about resilience, because the point is, under this framework, even if someone did, let's say, attack a single satellite, that wouldn't at a conceptual level impact the broader picture we're discussing here. So that in of itself, the resiliency in of itself provides a almost safeguard against taking any type of aggressive reaction that yeah, almost absolutely. certainly would be worse than the benefit you would get from taking out two, five, 10, 20 satellites. Absolutely. And so, you know, just looking at normal deterrence calculus, uh, if you can make the cost of an action exceed the benefit of the action, you have a far greater chance of deterring that action from happening. And as it turns out, the costs, especially to do a kinetic uh, operation against a satellite, are really, really high because you've got to launch that thing into space and you've got to have a guidance system on it that can actually get to where it needs to go and then make the kinetic uh, uh, impact happen. So that is a significant cost. Now, the benefit of that, I think, is inversely proportional to the number of satellites in that constellation. So again, if you've got one satellite, it might make it beneficial for the adversary in this case to uh, pay the cost to take that satellite out. But if you've got a thousand uh, of these vehicles, now the significant costs of knocking out one one thousandth of the constellation, all of a sudden the calculus changes significantly. So I, I do think that the number of satellites uh, actually can act as a deterrent. In this case, a concept I'd like to get at is one we discussed with Chris Bros from Andrew last week. Yeah, looking at so Chris wrote a Chris wrote a book um, about like the future future of warfare. Here we're talking about satellites. Always, I don't want to say lofty because that makes it seem inconsequential, or but 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 lofty, loft, lofty concepts. When you're looking at the actual conflict in Ukraine, though, especially if you're on the Russian side, the issue is that you can't keep up your logistics. You can't maintain air superiority. So these very sort of 1980s, 1990s, you have these specific set of issues. And we're talking about ideal next level type situations, let's say 2020s moving forward. So just as a, a, as a former pilot yourself and someone who's also thinking of these concepts, where on the hierarchy scale? do you think these sort of capabilities are? So for example, it, it, we're just, I guess, let me put it this way. We're, we're talking about these ideas and we're just aware of the fact that the Russians literally have rotting tires on, right. their, on, 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 their, on their, um, on their motorized vehicles. So how do you, how do you just think about this like future of war, but also very basic, let's say 1940s style problems? You bet. So I think Marshall, once a conflict begins, uh, those time-tested ideals uh, are probably the most important for the, the prosecution of that conflict. And, and I know that, that seems really wordy and maybe lawyerly, uh, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean. So right now, Russia is engaged in a physical conflict with Ukraine, and I agree with you 100%. Clearly, they do not have the logistics capability, or at least have not proven that they have the logistics capability to support that operation for any enduring amount of time. Uh, and as you said, you can have all the tanks in the world, but if they don't have treads on them, oil in them or fuel in them, they're not going anywhere and the tanks won't do anything for you. So I remember when I was a young fighter pilot, I thought I was the coolest person in the world because I was flying this really cool fighter. Uh, and as I graduated in age, I won't say maturity because my wife hmm. tells me I'm not mature yet, uh, but I started to learn that, you know, that old adage of, you know, the rookies talk tactics and the experts talk uh, logistics. Uh, that is 100 percent true. So, you know, to take it back to my domain, uh, when, you know, if I got my really cool F-16 and went to a theater of war, it would have been meaningless if it didn't have fuel, ammunition uh, or a large uh, amount of other services uh, in order to maintain the people required to fly that airplane, as well as the airplane itself. So that that is a given now. I'm going to take a slight step back because you know the the idea here. What I just said is the old school kind of industrial age uh, uh, things are are more important. Well, they're more important in that aspect. 
But let's let's think about this for a minute. The so far, just in open source reporting, uh, the the Russians have been engaged now for over a month with a really horrible logistics system. Why haven't they been routed yet? Why is this still going on if it is as bad as it appears to be? And my hypothesis in this is the Russians have been very good, as we've seen in the past, at using elements uh, that we wouldn't consider as part of kinetic war, whether that is disinformation, we used to call things like that propaganda, uh, but they've become masters at using some of those tools, uh, which whether they're being used internally to keep their own forces motivated or externally to keep potential partners uh, from uh, abandoning them, uh, these are important parts uh, of warfare. So when I think about some of those tools that are used, uh, AI is an important part of that. So, I mean, if you could be a very, very weak adversary and still maintain, uh, you know, your, your conflict for this long against what is mostly the united effort of the entire planet against you, that's in some ways pretty interesting. And mm -hmm. I think the only reason they're able to do that is through some of what, you know, in this context of this conversation are the newer tools. And so I think that there's importance that, that is going to apply to both. And taking a, a further step back to more the way the, the, the U.S. or I'll say Western allies typically fight wars, you know, if we can get to a position by using some of these advanced technologies where we can essentially disaggregate the, the, the analytical work and let a machine do that where it can, use fewer numbers of humans to focus on the harder problems, now I think we can put more humans uh, in areas where, again, we are best at, which is making the life or death decisions and actually being able to focus on the logistics and some of these harder things that uh, were required to actually prosecute a, a modern war. You know, it's interesting. Typically, and I'm sure you know of a conventional wisdom side of this, um, speaking as a civilian here, obviously, the perception is a fighter pilot such as yourself should feel tension with artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, the it's, and it's such a cliche now, 20 years in, but predator drones are doing the jobs that fighter jockeys used to do. There's okay. tension there historically, especially in the air force, there's tension between the bomber pilots and the fighter pilots and the transport pilots and the missile command, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Could you just, could you just a separate from the policy level, just talk right. about how you feel about AI given this received wisdom about how we think people like you think about this, but yeah. then take a step back and talk about the policy side of how you think, because you know we'll get into the machine teaming idea, which is really interesting, but just talk about this idea here. Yeah, so I will uh, use an example, I think, uh, and then explain why I think the example is important. So I, I flew F-16s uh, and you know when I sat in an F-16, in many ways, I was the aggregation engine for all of the sensors coming in. So I had a display that had a radar on it and I would see the incoming returns and I would take my brain power and understand what that was telling me and then make a decision based on that. I also had a radar warning receiver so I could tell if someone was locking a radar on me. I had engine instruments, other gauges, data link displays, uh, other displays uh, providing information from electronic warfare sensors. And so all of these uh, streams of information were coming to my eyes and my ears, and then my brain would process them. Uh, and I will never forget uh, one of the first times I got to uh, do a little bit of work in one of the new fighters that was coming out at the time. Uh, it was the, the F-22. We were just theorizing this. Uh, and I got a, a, a taste of what was called sensor fusion. And so in that airplane, one of the major innovations in the airplane, uh, beyond just the, the low observability, was the ability to take all those data streams and put them into one display. And I will never forget the first time I flew that simulator uh, to essentially do some pilot vehicle interface work. Uh, the display said something and uh, the instructor there said, okay, now you can take this action, which was essentially launching a missile. And I was, I, I, I was apoplectic. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. You're telling me I can do that now just because this computer says that these conditions have been met. And the guy looked at me and I said, well, what if I want to check on all the individual things that need to happen before I, as a human, would make that same decision? 
And the individual told me, he says, you can do this and then this and then this and then this, but why do you care? And I was incensed. Hmm. And Marshall, it took me about three days for me to get my head around this whole concept that at the end of the day, that computer in this case was actually way more efficient at analyzing those eight or nine different uh, sensor feeds and fusing them together into a single thing and helping me make the decision. And that once that decision was made, I could take my limited amount of human cognition and I could apply it to other problems that quite frankly were more important in the long run. So how are my, uh, my wingmen, how, how are we positioned? Are we positioned for the maximum amount of offensive advantage or defensive advantage based on the situation? You know, what, what are the other contextual cues going on? Are there things happening on the ground? So I was now able to take the limited amount of, of uh, attention that I had, and I could apply it to those higher order problems, which made me and my team a much more highly functioning team. So I was lucky to learn that early on. And then I, I flew with uh, predators and actually uh, performed operations with them in Iraq in 2003. And yes, uh, some of this I, I think is a bit political. Some of it is, uh, you know, tribal in that, you know, you've got a group of fighter pilots who think, you know, they're doing the most important thing with a group of uh, predator pilots who think they're doing the most important thing. And you're always going to have conflict there. But what I've seen over time are those conflicts that have gone down and are at the nature of good natured ribbing right now, rather than mm-hmm. real differences in the application of air power in this instance. You know, I predict we're going to see similar things as we start to see more autonomous vehicles uh, in the land environment, uh, as well as in the, the sea environment or the maritime uh, subsurface and surface environments. I, I just think that's a normal human reaction uh, to essentially having your cheese moved, uh, for lack of a better term. Now, in, in this last section, I want to I want to just focus on the most zoom out idea here, which is it's a real fundamental way we think of war um, around this idea of the fog of war. As in, there mm-hmm. are things you don't see, there are things you don't know. Um, if you, you know, go play StarCraft, like you can't see most yeah. of the map when you start playing. It's just, this is just an ingrained assumption here. And when you're talking about these thousands of satellites, you're talking about AA capabilities that are not only exist now, but are accelerating exponentially, but also to your point, enable specialization within these different segments. How much should we... So A, how, how much of these like longstanding ideas like fog war, how much are they challenged by what you're describing? And then what are, what are the, what are the, as much as we can know, what are the strategic implications that we should think about? Well, first off, I, I don't think the fog of war will ever, uh, will ever go away. Now, I think a lot of the activities that we're seeing in the, in the AI space right now will significantly, especially in the short term, reduce some of that fog, Uh, but much like anything else, I think you will see counters develop these things that will keep, that will increase the level of fog so that there will always be some sort of of fog, which is why, I mean, me personally, I never want to see, uh, you know, slaughter bots or, uh, you know, completely automated kill chains because I don't think we will ever create a, a, a group of sensors uh, that can cut through that fog so completely that I as a human would ever feel comfortable uh, taking that lethal decision out of a human's uh, mind and putting it in- into an electronic brain, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, so I-, I think we will always see that. Uh, and again, all despite all of our efforts to reduce the fog, uh, you can use some of the same technologies to increase the, the fog on your enemy. I mean, go- let's go back to Russian dis- disinformation, right? That's 100% designed to increase the fog of war. And even with some pretty phenomenal sensors we have, uh, a lot of this, I, I will go back to, to the media, right? Sometimes the first story is believed regardless of its veracity. So you can have a picture taken, but if someone has gone out there first and said the picture is false, even if it is 100% verifiable, you will end up with a sizable group of people who will always believe that it is false. Uh, And so that's why I think there's an asymmetry involved in some of this. 
And that might be a better term to discuss something we were talking about before. Whereas you've got kind of the old school things that are important, logistics, ammo, you know, ability to, to operate in the physical domain. Uh, and then over on this other side, you've got uh, things that are done in the electronic domain, whether those are cyber uh, attacks and protection, could be disinformation, could be AI. These things are, are working at an asymmetry. And at some levels, the electronic uh, things can have a greater impact, especially in the short term, than the, uh, the physical domain. So two questions to wrap. So first question would be, can you make very explicit the teaming aspect of this? So like you said, you have all these sensor inputs, which are analyzed at a machine learning level. What are the humans best? So actually, I, I loved your, your example of what you were best capable of doing in the F-22 context. So right. like what, so what, so if we don't need to be, so, it's we actually can't, you, basically your point is that we, there is no world where you could analyze everything in the first place. So it's, it's additive right. in a way that maybe the F-22 wouldn't feel the same way. There isn't going to be a, there isn't a uh, analysis person who says, no, I always enjoyed watching those, you know, 10 trillion different images. So that's a bit different, but what are humans best focused on doing then in this schema you're describing? So at present, I think humans still are better at applying context to, to different streams of information. And then always, I think humans are gonna have a better ability to apply morality to a decision. Because much like any other thing, uh, AI or a machine learning algorithm or an airplane or a boat, these are things and they are by definition amoral. So they take their, their morality based on the user uh, of that. So that is the human that is employing that tool. Uh, for instance, I mean, you can have a saw and you can use that for a very positive purpose by cutting up a board so that you can build a house. Uh, but that saw could also be used for a very nefarious purpose uh, in the hands of the wrong human. So I think uh, that is the ultimate thing is, is the morality piece, applying morality uh, to a decision. Uh, and I think an important part of that is understanding the context of the situation, because at all of the AI that people are talking about these days falls into the category of what a data scientist or a no kidding machine learning engineer would call narrow AI. I call it purpose specific AI. So let's go back to the beginning of the show. I talked to you about your, your uh, smartphone. You want to see pictures of your friends. So you type their name. That is an AI written for the very narrow purpose of identifying who you want to see pictures of. So a very uh, a narrow AI. The contrast to that is this concept of general AI, which is where you get into the you know, Skynet type things. Things become self-aware uh, and can reason in multiple environments and multiple domains on their own. And I don't think we're anywhere near that at this point. So at, at present, uh, I think machines are great at doing really rapid computation and given the appropriate amount of training, uh, and by the way, continuous training, uh, they can find things much faster than humans. Uh, and so I like to think of this in the, the smartphone era where I tell my smartphone, hey, these are the important things for me today. If I get near a grocery store, remind me to get milk. And then when I get near a grocery store, the cell phone knows my location it knows that we're near a grocery store. It gives me a notification. Hey, human, you told me to look for these conditions. Here they are. Uh, and then it reminds me to get milk. So using that same mindset, I can now offload that cognitive task of remembering that. Uh, and if I use that in a, um, in a, in a, a war fighting environment, uh, now I could perhaps circle, draw circles around certain parts of the map and say, all right, as an analyst, I would like to know when these conditions are met, certain number of enemy airplanes land at this airfield, or a certain number of enemy surface vehicles uh, get within this area. And now I can apply my human cognition to more important things at the time. When those conditions are met, ding, 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 I get a notification that these things are done. Now, if I need to dig into the images, great. But now I know those things have happened. That was the trigger that was going to make me do something else. So I... I you know, the professional pilot community calls this attention management, uh, whereby in different phases of flight, you focus on different things. Uh, this is not completely unsimilar, where we can now allow humans to focus on the more important thing at the time. And then when certain conditions are met, 
hey, you need to pull your attention over here to look at this for the time being. So that, that's where I see the, the value. And then allowing humans uh, to perhaps spend that additional time they have focusing on the things they are really, really good at, understanding context, and then the morality piece of it. So I want to close with a vision question. I normally ask this in my more tech focused uh, podcast, The Deep End, already going into this conflict, people had all this information that was unprecedented in terms of, wow, the Russians have X number of troops um, on the border. They are bringing in certain assets that you would only bring in if you're actually going to war. I'm referencing, for example, the, the plasma, the field hospitals that they wouldn't bring if this were merely a training exercise. So that at a historical, from a historical is, is that that's unprecedented. You can't launch a blitzkrieg completely unprepared under these circumstances. There's no going through the Ardennes if you're um, the Nazis in 1940 here. That's right. Given that status quo then, let's say in the next 10 years, let's say there's a similar situation, how will AI and machine tooling these team-based, how, how will they make the world look different from today, which already looks different than even 50, 60 years ago? Yeah. Well, Marshall, and this is the honest truth, my, my hope is that by using tools uh, like AI, we can get to the point where war is such an infrequent thing that we have to go back and look in history books <laughs> to really understand it or see it. Uh, now, that's the the what I would like to see happen. Uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily realistic in the short term. Uh, but what I do see is tools like AI helping identify the things that, that you've already mentioned so that we could predict where these outbreaks of violence might happen so that we can essentially get ahead of them. Uh, my concern with that is using the exact same example you provided. In this case, we had the, all that information beforehand and we're not able to prevent this, this conflict from starting. So I, I'm not here to make a value judgment and say we were not able or not willing, because uh, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, but in either case, the conflict actually began. So at a certain point, a human fallibility being what it is, even if we had the most up-to-date, accurate AI information to describe what you described, uh, would we prevent it? Because I think there's always going to be an, an element of, uh, of uncertainty, right? Because uh, in this case, hey, the field hospitals moved up, they had plasma there, they had fuel barrels there, they were moving tanks and people. Well, yes, that looks offensive, but were they using that to try to get somebody to hit attack them first, right? Mm -hmm. So that then they could respond to it. So there's always going to be an element of uncertainty. Uh, so I don't know if we will ever drive that to zero, uh, but I do think these tools uh, can help drive it down to a, a, I'll say a level to where we can make accurate enough predictions so we can prevent these things in the future. And in this specific example, you know, I'd like to think that maybe it's not just the number of images, but maybe you need a, a large corpus of imagery data coupled with a large corpus of other data. Maybe these are communications intercepts so that you can get to the point of understanding, all right, what is that leader or those group of leaders, what are they really thinking? Uh, and if the indicators are, yes, they are no kidding going to do this, uh, then we can hopefully get to the point where we can uh, develop policies that prevent those conditions from actually happening. Yeah, I, I want to end a, on a positive note. I was just thinking as, as you were talking about this, the, when it comes to the eliminating war aspect of this, which, which, which seems like foofy, but if you think about it, the way you eliminate war, aside from big peace treaties and international organizations, it's, it's reducing military aggression's ability to accomplish your political objectives. Okay. So if it is easier, so for example, if you can, if you could assemble hundreds of thousands of troops and conquer Kiev quickly, well, that makes war much more applicable, makes war a successful yeah. tool. Like that's the Klaus Witz, you know, war is just politics by another means. So by having the sensors that can detect the 
existence of truths by being able to identify all the various data points that limits one's ability. Because once again, like this is the, the positive thing. Like Kiev wasn't taken in three to four days. Like we're we're this is coming out around the month um, anniversary of the of the invasion. So I, I think that's I think that's the way of tying together the practical with the idealistic, which is tools such as this should decrease ideally the ability to engage in specific modes of warfare, the types of warfare that we, that we like the least. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I think that's just, that's just my reaction to what you're saying. And I think, and I think it's, I think it's important. Yeah. hundred percent Marshall, I think you're on the right track and you probably said it way better uh, than, than I did. Uh, but it really harkens back to the statements we were talking about earlier related to deterrence. So if the benefit that you were going to receive through this action is reduced or eliminated, then performing the action is almost nonsensical. And I, I am a bit of a foreign policy realist. Uh, I know that certain people seem like they might not be rational, uh, but I think for the most part, they are making rational cost benefit calculations. So if you can make that, uh, that benefit look really, really small, uh, then I think the likelihood you'll see the aggressive behavior uh, goes down. Well, Mark, this has been really great. Um, thanks for coming on uh, the show. Seriously, you you, you want to avoid. Um, I, I'm really interested in what Scale is doing, and you want to avoid things being a commercial. So, thank you, thank you for balancing the, this the, the cool work you're doing with actual thoughts on the topic. So, where where should folks who are interested in these? So, a like where should folks who want to learn more about Scale? Where should they go? And then beyond just like the website, obviously. Um, but when, if you're interested in the topics that you're really deeply interested in, where should they just like any suggestion of resources, books, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. We we actually uh, keep a pretty well uh, well updated blog on our Scale website. So uh, Scale.com. It's pretty simple. Uh, Welcome to follow me on LinkedIn. I try to link to many articles, not just created in scale, but things that interest me uh, uh, about war fighting, about using these types of technologies uh, to prevent war and in broader government use cases. Uh, so I encourage people to do that. Uh, I particularly I read a lot of the defense journals. I'm a big fan of the Strategic Quarterly. Uh, I read the Air Power Journal quite frequently. Uh, also, uh, for those who, who don't know, the Mitchell Institute of Aerospace Studies, uh, part of the Air Force Association, they have a great uh, series uh, of content that comes out, and you can get to them in several different formats, online, uh, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. cetera, uh, and, and I find that their stuff is, is really, really good. I'm a big fan of The Economist uh, and several other publications, so we're, we're probably all reading the same things, Marshall. That's awesome. Mark, thank you for joining us on the show and best of luck with all of your work. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Marshall. Appreciate it. And uh, you know where I am if any other questions pop up.